About six weeks ago, I had a great idea for this four-week project and a good video to go with it. I thought, focus stacking, the software, easy peasy. Well, this last six weeks has been a lot of things, but one of them is not easy peasy. It has been brutal, way over 50 different stacking operations, 4,000 photographs, a lot of reading, a lot of talking to people, a lot of research, and the end result is what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, normally, what I'll do is I'll do a video and then put out an article that has some photographs and uh, background information and other stuff like that. But this is different because the meat of this uh, discussion is actually the article. Uh, I wrote a series of three articles on Xerine and Helicon. Rather than make it into a, a super long video, I'm just going to hit the high points here. So this is really the complementary video to the articles. If you want to see all of the example photographs that I'm going to show today, as well as all the ones I won't get time to show today, they're in the articles over on the website. I'm gonna release all three articles at the same time with this video. If you don't watch anything else or you don't read anything else, read the conclusions at the end uh, because I think there's some information in there that will really, really help you if you're thinking about buying a stacking software program. Before we get started, thank you to Liz, Natalie and Glenn, my faraway fish farming friends, for your uh, continued support and friendship. I really do appreciate it. Thank you to everybody who's contributed through Patreon and uh, through the website to keep the, the, the show going. Really do appreciate your help. Thank you. If you have contributed or made a donation or joined Patreon or done anything nice, you will get a thank you letter from me. The problem is I'm now 700 emails in the hole. It's a particularly bad feeling to be that far behind, but bear with me, I, you will get a thank you from either me or from my estate. If you happen to have sitting at your house uh, an adapter for a microscope, for a, for a stereo microscope, so it will be a C-mount, M25 C-mount, uh, the kind of adapter that an puts a DSLR onto one of these with a little bit of room and a lens inside it so that you can that you can get a larger field of view. If you've got something like that and you're willing to lend it to me for a few months, I will make a video for you. Any kind of video you want about anything you want. Almost anything that you want. I've got these videos that I want to make. They'll be great fun. You'll enjoy them. You'd be doing a good thing too by letting me borrow it. You would. A few weeks ago, I suggested that you put your hands on any old lenses you happen to have sitting around or stuff you find at the junk shop or the thrift store, anything at all, like my radioactive lens here from Canon, and see if you can use it to take a macro picture or two and then send me the picture and a picture of the lens and tell me anything you know about the lens. And then what we're gonna do is a video about it and it will, will be fun. I was reminded by the person who has sent me several photographs uh, and he wants the damn video done <laughs> and I don't blame him I would too I don't even know how you close that so do that grab a lens any lens just make it interesting or funny and take a picture of something close up and send it to me Alan Walls photography but if you send it to contact at Alan Walls photography you can put an attachment on it the last thing when you're through watching this video if you have any energy left at all and want to help me out, please answer the very brief four question survey that's gonna be attached to the video somehow. The questions about focus stacking, they're very simple and they're very humorous. And uh, I just need to get a little bit of information so that I can better fashion my uh, content going forward. I wanna make sure I'm not giving you a lot of stuff you're not interested in. Focus stacking, is about the only way that we macro photographers can take pictures of really, really small things. Because when we're using magnification, of course, the depth of field uh, from our lenses is so shallow that uh, you can't get anything in focus. So at, at a magnification of like 20 times, 
the depth of field may be one and a half to two microns. That's one and a half to two thousandths of a millimeter. So we have to take lots of photographs and then use some kind of a computer program to pick out the bits that are in focus and connect them all together to make an image. Now, there are a number of different ways you can skin that cat. Uh, the, the first and uh, the cheapest is to use one of the free stacking programs. There are um, plenty of them. In the article, I've listed a lot of the currently available free stacking uh, programs that are out there on the internet. Uh, most of them are for uh, Windows computers. Obviously, the most appealing thing about a free stacking program is its freeness, and uh, they are free. Some of them, uh, some of them will ask you to make a little contribution, but it's usually very, very uh, minor, very, uh, very little. The problem is not so much with that as it is with the the software itself. Uh, these are computer programs that they'll share with you. So if you go and explore some of these free stacking programs, you'll see that they all have uh, a couple of things in common. Uh, one, they don't make the first lick of sense because they're all about computer programming and stuff like that. So you won't understand anything about it. And you have to know how to use computers to make the thing work. You know that part of a computer that opens up that looks like an old fashioned Pac-Man machine that has a blinky square on it? That's where you have to go to run these free programs. You have to type stuff into that like, you know, punch cards or something. And then it'll do your stacking for you, but it, you won't know it's doing it because it just does it in the background in secret. So if you're going to use a free program like this, you have to be a computer programmer so that you can make up a program that'll show you what's going on, by which time you would have been better off buying one of the programs I'm going to talk about today. But that's up to you. If you want to, to get the names of some of these free uh, programs and go look at them, I just warned you, but yeah, go, go for it. I've listed them in the article, in article part one. And uh, yeah, there, there's a surprisingly large number of them and they're very well received and people tell me they're very good. I'll never know that. Uh, that's the first way. The second way is not free. Well, it can be free, I suppose. It, it's when you have a, a stacking program that is bundled with your photo editor. Um, Photoshop has one, Affinity has one, On One has one, and the thing they all have in common is they're terrible. They have a graphic user interface so that you can see what you're doing. You can enter the photographs into the program, you can instruct it to make your, your stack for you, but not much else. It doesn't give you any tools for limiting or, or, or removing uh, artifact most of these uh, bundled stacking programs lack the sophistication of a purpose-built stacking program. They use a simple averaging system to determine whether or not something's sharp and uh, because they're not really uh, necessarily looking at any particular depth in the image, uh, they can select several depths at the same time, which means that you can end up and typically do end up with a lot of halos uh, a lot of ghosting, a lot of strange artifacts, especially around surface detail and hairs. They don't preserve color very well. They don't do much for texture and they're a, just the devil to try to retouch because uh, you, you, you can actually access the masks that are made in Photoshop and you can adjust those masks. But it's a tremendous amount of work for what is going to end up being a pretty... Uh, be a second rate stack at the end of the day. Now I have to tread carefully here because I know that some people are using these kind of stackers as their, their primary stacking engine. Um, most of those folks are not doing a whole lot of stacking. They are primarily outdoor um, live specimen macro photographers, which is fantastic, but like to occasionally focus stack or focus stack live subjects in the field. All of that is great and I encourage it. Uh, but every now and again, 
if you want to do high magnification work, that's when you really need to go with a real stacking program because the, 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 the relationship between complications of stacking is directly proportional to the amount of magnification and inversely pr- proportional to the thickness of your slices. So as you move up in magnification from one to one to two to one to, to magnifications of 5x and 10x and 20x, your, your photography gets exponentially more difficult, but so does your focus stacking. It leads to whole new levels of problems with artifact and ghosting and transparency. Uh, but to try to stack a, f- a photograph with more than 20 images or more than 10 Im- images on my computer in Photoshop, it- it's just not going to happen. I don't know if the new M1 chips can do it any better, but I know that my I would f- completely kill my computer if I put more than 10 images into Photoshop at once. And a lot of the photographs I'm going to be showing you today were 300 photographs. Um, yeah, Photoshop isn't going to do that. Neither is Affinity, neither is On One. There are only two programs that are going to do that. Uh, and they are the commercially available, popular, and, and widely known Helicon Focus and Xerine Stacker. They are surprisingly similar in many respects. They each have a few uh, unique features. And uh, I, I think the best way to understand what they are and what they aren't is to go through those, those features. Uh, they all offer unlimited depth stacking, which means you can stack as many photographs as you can take. Uh, you can put that number of photographs into either of these programs and it'll do the job. They both offer uh, several different algorithms, several different methods for doing your your stacking. Uh, They both have a depth map uh, method. They both have a pyramid-based method, which is they're just different ways of prioritizing the uh, uh, the, what is in focus and what is not using contrast. So both of these programs are able to process TIFF files as well as uh, JPEGs. And uh, they're they're both able to talk to um, Lightroom and do fairly seamless importing and exporting uh, to and from Lightroom. They can work with your rail. Um, You can uh, integrate these these programs with StackShot, uh, also with your tethering equipment. And uh, Helicon has a remote control for your camera, and you can also set that up with with, um, Xerine. I'll talk about the pricing in just a minute, but they're both essentially the same price. Then there are some features that are unique to one program or the other. And probably the most important ones are uh, Xerine's ability to uh, create substacks and slab, uh, as well as a very advanced batch processing uh, set of features. The specialized uh, brushes that are available in, um, in Xerine, they're going to get a special mention when we talk about the brushes in Helicon. And um, also the ability to, to create stereo rocking pairs, uh, animations in 3D, just from the stack of images that you put into uh, to Xerine. Uh, They both claim to do this. Uh, There are several things they both claim to do, but um, Xerine actually does this and has been doing this 3D animation since the very beginning. The reason, by the way, that Xerine came to be in the first place was Rick Littlefield uh, is a photographer, an extreme macro photographer with all kinds of interests in the area, but he's particularly interested in the three-dimensional patterns and shapes of very small objects. So he developed this program, the focus stacking program, as well as the the 3D animations and the stereo pair rocking uh, uh, workflows so that he could understand better the shapes of some of these very small things that he was photographing. So it was built by Rick because there wasn't anything available on the marketplace that did it. And And there basically still isn't. Uh, a friend of mine was using uh, Helicon uh, the other day and uh, decided to test the uh, 3D um, uh, the 3D functionality, which is a good thing because I can't do it. My computer 
actually physically laughs if you say the words three and D. Uh, it just thinks it's hysterical. It doesn't do 3D. It doesn't do bathrooms and it doesn't do 3D. But my friend was telling me that um, uh, he, he put a, 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 a photograph, a set of photographs that he's been using for other things for a long time into this program and, and ran the, the 3D uh, rendering. And um, it made a lot of mistakes and, uh, and put out a, a very inaccurate 3D picture of, of, the, uh, of the subject. So that was interesting to me. I wish I could have tested it myself, but uh, things being as they are, that's never going to happen, not on that machine. So uh, the things that uh, Helicon claims to have as unique features are kind of interesting. One of them is a very interesting and unique raw in DNG out functionality. That means you take raw images right out of your camera or right out of your Lightroom folders and you transfer them into Helicon. It stacks these raw files and gives you back a DNG, a, 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 a file that is essentially unchanged from the raw file. So what you're getting is a, a virgin raw file to then go ahead and edit. If you've ever tried to uh, edit in Lightroom uh, an output from a focus stacking program, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. It is a fundamentally different process than actually uh, editing a raw file. So the idea that you can edit raw files that have been stacked is very appealing. It's also very not true. It doesn't do that. What it does is it takes as inputs your raw files and then converts them to TIFFs behind the scenes and then imports and stacks the TIFF files. There's something else that uh, Helicon does when it's making this conversion from the DNG files or the raw files to TIFFs to stack. And that is it retains the color profile uh, that the uh, image comes into uh, Helicon with. And... Um, in my more cynical moments, I wonder if maybe that is so that when the, the uh, TIFF comes back out of the program and heads over to Lightroom, uh, it has the color profile uh, of the raw file and um, looks less changed than it actually is. There's one other, one other thing when it comes to retouching. I've talked a lot about slabbing, and I think anybody who, who watches this channel knows that I am a strong advocate of routinely doing slabbing as a way to drastically cut down on the amount of time spent in retouching. Um, if you read the documentation for Helicon, it kind of gives you the impression that they slab. Um, they do have a way that you can break your program up or break your stack of photographs up into sub stacks and have each of those stack. Uh, the problem is using them as uh, inputs into the same project where the original files uh, reside is impossible. You have to use one or the other. Uh, in Xerine, you're able to accumulate all of these files, stack selected, the slabs, the individual input files. You have them all at your fingertips in the same program to jump for, from one to another any way you want to, to retouch. Now, that's what I mean when I describe a, a full set of retouching tools. It's those things. Um, he, uh, Helicon doesn't have them. The Darken and Lighten brushes are two of the smart brushes uh, in, in uh, Xerine's uh, retouching uh, brush box. There are three. There's the, the one that uh, the, the Rick invented, the proprietary one that does such a great job of kind of figuring out what you want to retouch while you're doing it. Uh, it's very, very, very good uh, and saves so much time. Um, and his light and darken brush are actually like pixel transfer brushes that have a built-in blend mode device so that uh, when you use the darken brush, it will only apply pixels if the resulting pixel is darker than the starting pixel. That can save you so much time 
in removing Halo. It's just night and day different. If you have to remove Halo without damaging dark structures that are underneath the Halo, you'll be at it for the rest of your life. It's just so difficult. And the more magnification, the harder that gets. So there are similarities in the names of these features. There is no similarity in the function of these features. And that's important to know. There are a bunch of uh, bells and whistles features that uh, uh, Helicon has that Xerine doesn't. Things like the ability to drop a, a ruler onto your photograph or to write text onto the photograph. Uh, you can get a grid overlay on the picture. Uh, what else does it do? It has a dodging and burning tool, a texture transfer tool, a clone stamp tool, all of these in the, in the uh, retouching module. Uh, when I asked Rick uh, why he doesn't have them, his answer was a very good one. Uh, it was, well, Photoshop does that, and my program is a stacking program. If it doesn't have anything to do with stacking, I, I don't want to distract the, the, you know, our effort from what we're trying to do here, which is always the same thing. It's create the highest quality output images with the least investment in human time. That, that's their prime directive at Xerine. That's the raison d'etre. That's what they do. They create the highest quality stacked output images with the least amount of human investment. And uh, yeah, it shows. So uh, there are clearly uh, differences between the programs, more so than you'd get just from reading the blurb. A word about Xerine. I've been using Xerine for years and I use it every day. I consider myself a pretty accomplished retoucher and I know pretty much all of the, the, the tricks for doing the job pretty well and pretty quickly. I can say none of those things for retouching in Helicon and that's on me. My experience in Helicon has been five weeks maybe six weeks now. Um, so I, I, it, it's a very hard for me to, to be uh, very critical of their, of their program when I don't have the experience with it. Maybe there are things that I don't know. But my experience retouching in, in other programs leads me to believe that's probably not the case, but I'm willing to, to give them some benefit of the doubt. When this all started um, about six weeks ago, I uh, wrote to both Rick Littlefield of Xerine and to the public relations team at Helicon. I heard back from them both within a couple of days. Uh, Rick told me he would get me answers to all of my questions. I asked uh, about 10 questions and they were the, largely the same questions. Um, some about the, the, the claims that they're their um, companies made for their product uh, and others addressed their plans for the future and that type of thing. All the things you'd want to know from a company. Rick got back to me and said he would have me uh, a full complete answer to all of these questions by the end of the week. Um, this was on Monday. I got the full uh, multi-page document uh, on Wednesday and uh, it was extremely helpful in putting this information together. I eventually heard back from Helicon. Unfortunately, their, their uh, response ended up in my spam folder. This was about halfway through the process. So what I did was I delayed the production schedule for this video to give them time to respond to my follow-up questions because only a few of my questions were answered. There were a lot of uh, questions that they asked uh, in, in return. So I, uh, I did that, I responded to them, and as of right now, I haven't heard from them. Given the fact that Helicon is in Kharkiv um, in the Ukraine, and they're, what, 10 hours ahead of us, time-wise, might be more than that, I'm willing to cut them all kinds of slack for the communication thing, but it's still worth mentioning that I don't have answers to these basic questions. And I did explain to them 
uh, that I was doing a fairly large project comparing their program to, to um, Xerine. So what I did was I just started selecting uh, photographs to make based on how difficult they would be to photograph and based on the magnification needs. The idea was that over a period of four weeks, I would photograph everything. I would use every lens that I have and I would photograph things that were minuscule, tiny, at 20 times magnification, all the way up to the things that were you know, one to two and needed a macro lens. And that's what I did. Um, I, I photographed a lot of things, bugs as well as inanimate objects. And I have had to be very selective in the photographs that I've chosen uh, to use in, in, in this comparison. And you'll be surprised because I have been pretty negative about Helicon thus far. Um, but I'm not going to be negative about them for much longer because uh, their, their stacking program is really impressive. Uh, because relatively little that we're going to be talking about has a, a, an objective kind of output, something that we can measure to compare the two, like the time it takes to, to run the stacks, we can measure that. What we can't really do is, is measure the quality of the final output, which really, to me, is the most important result, is what does the final picture look like? Has it got artifact or gaps, or is it perfect? That's the end result we're looking for. So uh, it, seeing as that is a very subjective evaluation, and seeing as I have a built-in bias uh, to favor the product that I use, Xerine, I had to be extra careful. So what I did was I used other people uh, to get opinions on image pairs. Uh, kind of randomly throughout the process, I would just select a handful and ask friends to, to put a check mark on the, the, and these were photographer friends, uh, to put a check mark on the be better picture and tell me why. And um, Throughout the entire six weeks, uh, there's been a strong correlation between the feedback I got from my friends and what I was seeing myself. But it's less of an issue than I thought it would be because going into this, I thought that Xerine was going to be the better stacker in every sense of the word. At the end of the day, it is the better stacker. And I'll show that and I'll explain why. Uh, but not for lack of a number of really impressive features from from Helicon, the first of which is just the plain speed of the program. Not having used it in years and having no real recollection of the interface, when I downloaded it and set it up on my computer and, uh, and started running stacks, I was completely unprepared for how quick it was. I didn't even realize what was going on until after the A method stack was finished stacking. Uh, I thought it was just aligning the photographs or something, but it was done and it spat out uh, a, a result. And then the, 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 the B method and the C method were just as quick. I was so unprepared for that. I immediately called a friend of mine out in uh, California to, to tell him that I had a feeling that I was about to have an upset that Helicon was not what I thought it was. He just hung up on me. He does that every time I call at three o'clock in the morning. The point was though, I was impressed and I remain impressed when I download a large 200 uh, image stack into Helicon, it's done in a twinkling and that's good. That is a huge time saver. I was not very far into this process before I realized that the output images that Xerine and Helicon were making were oftentimes indistinguishable. And equally often, the Helicon image looked better. And, and that really surprised me. I was not expecting that. Uh, but it happened over and over and over again. So I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time going through examples of the photographs uh, because 
uh, they're all in the articles and you can see them in full resolution there. But I'm going to show you a couple to just give you a feel for what I saw. So in addition to being completely nonplussed by how quickly this program ran, I was also uh, initially extremely impressed with the quality of the outputs. I say initially, I'm still impressed with the quality of the outputs. Um, the uh, Helicon program uses three algorithms. The first one is uh, called the method A. The method A is a very simple, basic, averaging type program. It uses a fixed domain to check for contrast. And it's independent of depth, uh, which means that the, the program can select points at different levels uh, in the image, which pretty much guarantees there's going to be halo around everything. And that's pretty much what you see. Though a couple of the A outputs were pretty impressive. Most of the time they're covered in halo. Uh, I didn't find any situation in which the A output would be the one I would keep. So I have a feeling that the A out that the, the A method is probably not going to survive the next big uh, upgrade. The two methods that are important are method B and method C. Method B is a depth map and uh, it's very uh, uh, analogous to what happens in Xerine in the DMAP uh, algorithm. Uh, unlike DMAP, it doesn't give you quite as much control. Uh, you do have some control over the equivalent of the estimation radius, which is nice, but you don't have any control in real time over the contrast threshold, which is something we talked about uh, in a recent video. That, uh, for, for somebody uh, who uses the program a lot, is a little bit of a problem. You would like to be able to, uh, to have control over that. The Pmax algorithm in Xerine is uh, very similar uh, to the C method in Helicon. There's a difference, though, that, that bothered me. I'll show you a few examples here. You, th this first example is Colifera. It's a, it's a fly uh, that's had all of its legs pulled off, not by me. This was the condition I found it in. And um, uh, this particular image also has a blue filter on it that I put on there just to see what it would look like and forgot to take it off. Uh, so that explains that. But you'll, you'll notice that the, the quality of the two outputs is very similar. Uh, this second uh, housefly, the little uh, musker housefly, uh, also shows the images to be really pretty close uh, to one another. As you'll see in the articles, what I've done wherever possible is put D maps next to B methods and put C methods next to P maxes wherever possible. So you're looking at the same equivalent output. And after you've looked at a lot of these, you'll start to notice a, a significant difference in the uh, amount of contrast and the uh, color in the, the Helicon outputs. They look quite colorful, um, almost too colorful for a, for a, a pyramid type algorithm. And uh, they also um, don't have nearly as much um, excess contrast as you expect from a Pmax. You, the Pmax algorithm is designed to retain surface detail. You retouch from a Pmax. Usually what I recommend people do is, is use the DMAP for its color and texture, and then onto the DMAP, put the details or transfer the details from the Pmax. And that's exactly the way I would retouch in Helicon also. But when you are looking that closely at the C method outputs, they don't look nearly as granular and as contrasty and as washed out as the counterparts do in um, Xerine Stacker. Now, unfortunately, uh, I didn't really think to do this until after the fact but uh, I don't have any really striking examples of this difference uh, like I have seen since. Uh, but um, if, you, if you're familiar at all with Xerine, you know what I'm talking about. The Pmax always comes back very um, uh, granular, noisy, um, 
over contrasted and uh, too bright and too dark at the same time. Well, that's what over contrasty means, isn't it? <laughs> Some of these examples, the, the stacking outputs looked so good from both programs, there really wasn't any, anything in it. Sometimes the uh, D map would look a little bit better than the B, but just as often the B would look better than the, the D map. Sometimes the artifact was worse in, in the Helicon program. Sometimes it was worse in the Xerine program. There was really, I'm sure there is a pattern to it uh, that I'm just not seeing. It seemed almost random that uh, you, you'd see these um, uh, differences that, that ought to have some kind of rhyme or reason. The, the truth is that there are a lot of variables that we're comparing. When, when we compare two images, even though the images themselves are identical, that they're, they're the same stack, there are differences in uh, the, the, the way the program works in terms of where the estimation radius is set, where the smoothing radius is set, where the contrast threshold is. And even a slight change in any one of those could be what's causing the difference between the two. And because they are different programs, they're not running the same code, you would expect there to be differences. And uh, I suppose you would expect there to be differences in both directions. So it probably is, is not as surprising as, uh, as it felt when I was looking at them. So anyway, I, I encourage you to go over to the website and look, scan through all of these photographs and, and see if, if you can get a feel for how similar these programs are. Now, Based on that, and I'll, I'll give the, the disclaimer here that this is my opinion. This was my experience. I did the, all the looking at and deciding about what I liked and what I didn't like. And uh, what I'm about to tell you about these programs is also my opinion. You need to make up your own mind what your opinion is, and I encourage you to do that. I didn't say this at the beginning, or maybe I did. I think that your choice of stacking programs is one of the most important decisions you're gonna make in macro photography. It's as important as the lenses you buy. It really is. I've told the analogy for several different purposes before, and I'm gonna say it again. It's the analogy of learning how to play the guitar. My, my guitar teacher, uh, told me to get the best guitar that I could afford. And he was absolutely right, because if I had got the, the guitar I could really afford, my fingers would have been bleeding after every session. I wouldn't have liked the sound, and after a while I wouldn't have picked it up again. And that, that is kind of the point. If you're trying to do, uh, if you're trying to push yourself push your skills in macro photography and get more into the extreme macro photography using microscope objectives, doing all of these things that are so cool and exciting when you start doing them and forever, but you're doing it with a stacking program that just is not up to the task, uh, you'll lose interest. Your pictures won't be any good. And that will be why. That'll be a big part of why. So it is an important decision, and I want you to make the best decision that you can. I'm going to tell you what I think you should do <laughs> at the end. I'm going to give you some recommendations. So let me sum up what this experience has told me and tell you why that is. Uh, I think that um, Zerine Stacker is a superior stacking program uh, for all users. And I say that without reservation. Uh, because whether you are using advanced stacking techniques like slabbing now or not, it doesn't matter. Y you are using an inferior tool if it cannot do that. Now, Helicon told me in the letter that they wrote me that they have a major upgrade uh, coming up. They invited me to, uh, to be part of their beta testing group. Uh, which I accepted and I never heard from them again. So I haven't had a chance to look at the program and see what it what they're adding and what, what it will do. But uh, I, I 
I believe that they have to have been prioritizing uh, this uh, function of slabbing. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know. We'll just have to wait and see when it comes out. So I was summarizing things into points. The first point being uh, Zerine Stacker is the better stacking program for all comers. And that is on the basis of the fact that it actually has a retouching suite of tools that work. It has the ability to slab and uh, do selective stacking, which are just mandatory uh, um, functions of a stacking program. The, the way it feels to me right now is that Helicon has the first half of a world-class stacking program. It's just missing the second half. And before it can compete with the likes of Zerine Stacker, it has to build that functionality and it has to be as slick and as usable as Zerine. In my opinion, they could lose a lot of the unnecessary bells and whistles. They make the program look more capable than it is. It's already very, very good. It's time to focus on the finishing of the picture. The, the reality is, if you're trying to use Helicon as your only uh, stacking option, you're going to have to either retouch in Helicon, which will mean retouching from individual images and in deep stacks, that's just impractical, or you're going to have to abandon retouching altogether and just accept either the DMAP or the PMAX. Uh, excuse me, either accept the, the C algorithm or the B algorithm and then take it into Photoshop and do extensive reworking on it to get rid of the artifact. Why would you do that when there is a program that has tools designed to get rid of the artifact? And that's my point. You can't really make a compelling argument that the Helicon product is on a par with Xerine when it only has half the functionality. Which also is kind of my argument for what you should be shopping for if you're looking for a stacking program. We can get into that now. Xerine is in it for the long haul. They're not flashy. Uh, they don't do a lot of marketing and frankly, the interface is, is a little dated. Um, it's not flashy and modern looking like, uh, uh, like Helicon is, but it doesn't really care. It's not, it's not important. The look of the interface really doesn't change how the thing stacks images, and that's all it cares about. That is the biggest reason I think uh, Helicon has so many adherents is because it gives so much flash up front. It's fast. It's got a beautiful interface. Everything looks, looks functional and professional up front. They've got dozens, hundreds of beautiful photographs on their website. And it just gives you a very strong impression that it's a, a very accomplished um, program, which it is. Don't get me wrong. It is a very accomplished program. Even Rick Littlefield admires the, the coders that have managed to break through this speed barrier the way they have. But that, none of that changes the fact that it doesn't have the full functionality. Now, whatever kind of macro photographer you are, it, whether you are just now starting and you have no interest in doing anything else other than photographing butterflies in the garden, that's fine. But if you are going to do any focus stacking at all, unless you are 100% positive you are never going to stack anything smaller than a boiled egg, then I would recommend that you get a full service stacking program that will grow with you. Because as sure as the day is long, you'll buy the more expensive program because you don't need all of the pro features that you get in Xerine. 
and then discover that you have more interest in this than you thought and you need the more powerful tools and you've got to make another purchase because they don't exist right now in Helicon. They may exist and they may be good or they may exist and they may not be good or they may never exist. I don't know. I mean, I would expect that they would tell me that they've got a big release coming out that's going to fix all the problems. That's what you're supposed to say. But we'll have to see. I mean, uh, you'll probably see it before I do. So as accomplished as the Helicon program is, and as much as it has going for it, I don't think it's a good purchase for a macro photographer. There are people who I think could get a lot of use out of it and it be the ideal uh, package for them. The way I see it, there are probably three groups of photographers that may be interested in Helicon as their, their stacking program. The first are the absolute newbies. Don't really know what they want to do in macro photography. And that's what I mean by newbie, not necessarily to photography, but maybe to photography too. But they really don't know where they're going to take it. In my opinion, to get a program that limits where you can go, especially when that program costs more, just on the basis of it being faster, is a mistake. I would never advise one of my students to do that. Even if they had no initial interest in high magnification stuff, because as I said earlier, there is a there is a direct uh, correlation between how difficult or how high the magnification is and how good your stacking program needs to be to get high quality outputs. The second group are people who do, say, still life photography or product photography or uh, architectural photography, and, and they do focus stack. Uh, but they focus stack small numbers of photographs and they really don't need uh, sophisticated retouching tools and they never will because they're never going to photograph anything smaller than a Volkswagen. In that case, I think Helicon is a, a great option because it's rocket fast. They'll get their work done quicker. But that second group, I think, would be a legitimate uh, target for Helicon to go after. The third group are the extreme macro photographers. That is anybody who is taking photographs at greater than one-to-one -one magnification. If you're doing that, even though what you're doing today sounds like it would fit neatly into what uh, Helicon can do, again, I would never recommend it. Even if you have no interest in ever touching a microscope objective, why would you want to get a program that right from the start limits what you can do in exchange for a program that's three times faster? Let me, let me share one notion with you about the three times faster thing. It would be a very big mistake to uh, assume that, that that three times faster is from the stack to the finished photograph. That is not what I'm talking about. Three times faster is what I measured the stacking program and I included the export time. So from hitting export, no matter how many photographs it was, to the stack being run, as in having the, the C, the, the B, the DMAP, the PMAX outputs, was three times faster in Helicon. The amount of time to go to a finished, ready to publish photograph was exponentially greater with greater magnification. It took longer to make a photograph at higher magnification. And the amount of time it took in Helicon went through the roof. So you're rushing through the first step and getting the first output very quickly. And then you have to spend the rest of your life retouching it. 
which is completely the opposite of what happens in Zurine, where the, the stacking process is kind of slow and ponderous. And if you're good and you think and you make good decisions at every step along that slow and ponderous way to get the first stack done, you'll have less artifact because the tools in Zurine are designed to be used to limit the amount of artifact. That's something that doesn't get said or heard nearly often enough. The sliders that we talk about, the, the estimation radius, the, the smoothing radius and, and the contrast threshold, what these sliders do is remove, contra, remove artifact preemptively. Now, there's some of it you'll never be able to remove and you have to retouch out. That's why we slab. Slabbing, by the way, doesn't result in better outputs. And that is one of the, the findings from all of the photographs I took, because I slabbed everything. I slabbed everything on the Zerine side because I didn't want to spend all day retouching. And what I noticed was that the final, the final slab output, which would be the stacked Pmax slabs as a DMAP, the final image, in other words, was uh, as good, uh, sometimes not as good, as the single stacked helicon, which is saying something. But then again, slabbing is not really about getting a better outcome from the initial photograph. It's about getting a higher quality image when you retouch it. And that's what you can do quickly and accurately with a slabbed image. So in my opinion, there are a very select group of people to whom Helicon makes any sense to me until they add the functionality and show us that it works. I cannot justify spending more money on a program that does less and that is missing some of the most important features in a stacking program. So as much as I want them to succeed because I think having the competition in the market is very valuable to all of us. And I, I think Mr. Littlefield would agree. It keeps everybody honest, uh, but they have work to do. When I was doing this testing, we had a little bit of bad weather here. And uh, three times in the month that I was using it, um, bad weather broke my internet connection. And every time it happened, I lost all of the data uh, in uh, uh, Helicon. I would run both stacks together. Helicon and Xerine would run on my computer at the same time. I couldn't do anything else, but they would run together. When the internet went out on those three occasions, Helicon kept going, uh, I mean, Xerine kept going uh, all the way through because it's a laptop, it was on battery, no problem. Uh, but on every occasion, Helicon stopped running, the program closed and the, and the progress was lost. But when I asked them about it, they told me 100% of the work is done locally. So I'm really not sure what's going on. I don't know enough about computers, but I thought I'd mention it. There's one other thing, and this might just be my old computer, but when I export from Lightroom into Helicon, the export progress bar never goes away in Lightroom. And in fact, Lightroom continues to eat up a huge amount of CPU during the export. And the whole time I'm stacking the images in Helicon, that export is still going on. I don't know what it's exporting or where it's exporting to, but as soon as I close Helicon, not only does the progress bar go away in Lightroom, but Lightroom um, crashes. So. I, I told them about this in my letter and uh, was hoping they'd give me some kind of insight into what I was doing wrong, but I, I never did uh, hear back from them, like I said. So I'm none the wiser. But it is, it is something that makes me question whether or not I want it on my computer. So they have work to do. And according to them, they're doing it now and their next release is gonna solve all of these problems. And if it does, more power to them. I think it'll be good for everybody. Uh, but if it doesn't, if it still leaves these glaring gaps, I think that uh, if you're serious about your photography, you need to stick with Xerine uh, until such time as it's safe to test the waters elsewhere. 
go over to my website, check out the photographs, check out the article. It took me a long time to write. It's got a lot of good information in it. Somebody go read it. And while you're over there, click on one of those links to Amazon. It's links to things you need, like memory cards. But do you know that if you click on one of my links and go to Amazon and end up just buying dog food and a boomerang, I still get a little credit for that. I didn't know if you knew that, but if you use one of my links to go to Amazon to get anything, that helps me. And anything that helps me keeps this kind of stuff coming. Of course, after this one, you might not want to help. Don't forget your lens photographs. Any lens, macro photograph, turn it around backwards and take a close up and send it to me with a picture of the lens. All right, check out the website, check out the article, check out the links and then buy something. Anything expensive. See you in a few days, take care.